Hi, this is John Reed. I'm live from Half Moon Bay, which I sometimes affectionately call a white collar prison. That's not nice though. It's a lovely setting. Uh, we're at Constellation Connected Enterprise. I'm with Steve Wilson. How are you doing? I'm doing great, John. And you can leave any time you like. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. I don't know how I would get out. To leave. <laughs> Who would want to leave with all these scintillating conversations? We just got off some excellent quantum computing and blockchain debates. And blockchain is a topic that you have been known to chime in heavily on. And we're going to get to that. And we're also going to talk a little bit about identity because that's a major focus of your research. Just for our listeners, this is my first time with uh, Steve of Constellation. There reason I sought him out is because I think he's one of the most interesting voices in the enterprise. I like people with strong convictions who are also really diligent in their research and are prone to occasionally evolving their ideas. That sounds like Steve to me. Is that a fair description? I think that's very fair, John. I'm, I'm a scientist by training and um, I like to think that I am, um, you know, when the facts change, you change your mind. Yep. That's the right way to play it. I think uh, my colleague Dan Hallett says, talks about strong opinions Lucy held. Yeah, I like yeah. that. So Loose, uh, loosely bound opinions, yeah. and we could talk about that. We could talk about identity, the way it binds to things, and it gets yeah. too, too tightly bound to things. And yeah, because yeah. Um, you, you have a pretty strong position on identity, which is not necessarily encouraging. But we got to get into that. Before we do that, I just want to just get your general reactions because it was interesting today. Tell the listeners just a little bit about your role at Constellation, because you guys have, I think, somewhere around eight analysts. What is your focus area? We call it digital safety and privacy. So my background is digital identity now for about 25 years, and I'm going to keep calling it identity, but we might get around to um, speaking about why I want to change that word sometime. But for now, let's call it digital identity, privacy, cryptography. And uh, Ray Wong and I, a couple of years ago, decided to wrap all that up under the banner of, of safety. You know, we're a very focused firm we don't have the resources to go after cyber security and enterprise security and all of that stuff, as important as it is. But we're also a little bit cross-disciplinary and we think that safety is the right kind of theme word uh, for what we're doing, you know, keeping people safe online. So in the morning session, you guys had an interesting lightning round where every analyst at your firm went through kind of their preoccupations, their big questions. What, what was your takeaway from like what you do? How does it tie into all these other themes around digital transformation, customer experience? How do you fit all these things in your mind? Yeah, you bet. Um, look, I've been tracking a sea change in identity now for 10 or 20 years um, and finding that the tools that we have developed for digital identity management turn out to be tools for conveying, let's call it the reliability or the trustworthiness um, of data of signals about people and it turns out that the problems that we've been trying to solve in digital identity are actually much bigger problems across the digital economy to do with verification of claims verification of data the provenance of data so we keep finding that the, that the big themes are for example somebody said just now the reliability or the trustworthiness of, of data is one of the big problems with big data you know nonsense in nonsense out and um, we've got problems with fake news with deep fakes with um, reliability online, like what the hell is going on online? Well, and that and came to a head for you um, in a post that you updated and published in June of this year, which you simply titled Identity is Dead. Yes. Tell so, us about that. Look, I'll, I'll, um, I don't want to dilute my message by talking about the rhetorical flourish, but mm. look, it is a rhetorical device. Um, I was in the quality movement in the 1980s, and uh, after a while of spectacular failures of quality listed companies, quality certified companies, the whole ISO 9000 industry pretty well came and went. And there was a bumper sticker for a while amongst analysts to the effect that quality is dead. Now, not for a second did anybody mean that quality didn't matter anymore, but quality with a big Q, meaning the sort of formulaic, standardised cookie cutter approach to quality, had failed to deliver. And I absolutely say without apology that the digital identity movement has, has failed to deliver on a big promise that we had 10 or 12 or 13 years ago, that you would be able to reuse digital identity across all of your walks of life. It's exactly what the White House's NSTIC, National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, it's exactly what NSTIC was premised on. Um, the White House CIO said a student would be able to wake up in the morning and use her student card to log on to her health records and to do her banking. You know what's really interesting about that is that it seems like We've come so far in terms of the convenience of what we do, but identity hasn't kept up. 
right? So in other words, we're doing a lot of very convenient things like mobile banking, but our identity is prone to fraud, neglect, yeah. uh, hacking, everything. Yeah. The, you know, there's the famous convenience security um, trade-off um, that preoccupies a lot of people. And look, it's true that people um, get away with things online. Um, and I think it's still a little bit like the early days of the automobile. You know, things are far from ideal, but we're going ahead at, at breakneck speed, literally. Um, and it is a paradox as to why does digital identity seem to lag. Well, and one of the really disconcerting parts that you've spent some time on is how every new solution to solve this identity problem seems to end up being as deeply flawed as everything that's come before it. So it's like, okay, biometrics are going to solve this, but mm. then facial, rec rec facial recognition turns out to be just another can of worms as far as this is concerned. Yeah, I'm afraid so. And look, let me, let me not be too negative. We are making fantastic progress. And down in the plumbing, you know, your listeners may or may not know about the protocols and the standards, but they're, they're going really well. Um, and we do have really easy-to-use biometrics for unlocking an iPhone or a, 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 any mobile phone. It's fantastic easy-to-use technology, actually quite difficult to hack some commodity fingerprint readers now, but not impossible to hack. And so it's all about expectation and it's all about scale. And then even things like two-factor identification, which are certainly not perfect, but then um, you you learn, you see all the stats on how few people actually use it. So it's like there's there's yeah. a problem there too, it's right? It's not just a technology shortfall, it's a, yep. it's a human discipline issue. So look, let's say that it depends on what you mean by two-factor as well. I mean, using SMS messages for two-factor is a disaster. And right. It should never have happened. Yeah. But now we've got, um, the idea is phone as a second factor, using your, your phone itself is a two-factor device. You've yeah. used a biometric or a good PIN number to unlock it. But there's also behaviour, John. We can rely on the fact that people really look after their phones. It's very rare to actually lose your cell phone. You, you, you know mm. that it's gone within minutes, unlike a wallet. Um, so we can leverage that. The, the, the binding, it's called binding. That My phone, let's say, is never out of my control and I've got it PIN protected, I've got it biometrically protected. So why don't we take advantage of that? And mm. this is what, say, the FIDO Alliance is all about an industry alliance in, in security, and it leverages the fact that almost everybody's got a phone and almost everybody protects their phone, and so why not use that as the second factor? If you can send an electronic signal into a bank over the internet that seems to have come from Steve Wilson's unlocked phone, let's assume it's Steve Wilson at the other end. It's a phone as a second factor. It's powerful. Right, because you're going to look after your phone almost as aggressively as you would your, sure. your dog or, in some cases, more aggressively than your spouse. So it does carry weight. Now, this also translates, you, you know, I, I don't want to represent you as the as a king of sensational blog headlines, so you've been pretty good at a few of those. But you, you dive into research, and I think one of your big points in this research you gave me on data supply chains is you make a point in here that the fact is that data brokers aren't going away. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we need to keep, plugging away at this because there's, they're brokering our data every single day now, so we need to figure out solutions. Absolutely. And let me say that I, you know, I'm using the term data broker in a really broad sense. There will be data business models um, emerging in the next 10 years that don't necessarily look like the infamous data brokers we have today. But certainly the idea of, of data as a, as a resource and an asset. I like to talk about data refining. We've had the data mining metaphor for a while, but it's only the start of a supply chain. You, you metaphorically dig up data from people's, you know, the, the exhaust of their day-to-day -day digital life. But that data will pass from one hand to another through a whole bunch of intermediaries, and let's call them brokers, who are adding value, they're running analytics, they're discovering stuff. Now, for sure, today, most of that comes under surveillance capitalism, and it's pretty dark, and it's a, it's a double... It's a double whammy. We've got um, shady characters making money out of our data without us knowing it, and worse, to rub salt into the wounds, they're, they're getting breached. And um, that's a terrible thing. But, you know, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The reality is that data is valuable. <clears throat> it's actually too valuable for people to look after for themselves. This is not the Wild West. Um, we need to evolve security from the sort of do-it-yourself security, pack your own six-shooter and um, keep the bad guys out. We need to evolve through the sort of Pony Express stage of, of, of data management and get to a point where there are responsible data intermediaries who are being held to account. I thought that was a pretty important point in the research you sent along to me, which which was 
you know, we, we take such a cynical view towards regulatory bodies, and yet they must be part of the solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we have actually detected in the last two or three years a, a shift in sentiment towards the GDPR in the USA. Mm. Um, by and large, you know, the people that come to this event, to Constellation Connected Enterprise, are, are pretty measured in their view about privacy management. I think most, most people in the C-suite in the USA um, appreciate the need for data protection. Data privacy is good. It's going to be good for business. And um, it needs to come with a, with a measure of regulation. So, I mean, for heaven's sake, the California has passed GDPR-like um, regulation. And, and uh, we think that it's the start of the right level of regulation that goes with the digital economy. So what's next for you with this research? What, what, where, do you, where do you want to go next? You've issued some interesting stuff. Well, my um, call to action, if you like, that identity is dead, is actually um, the headline for let's repurpose um, our thinking and our patterns and our digital management protocols. We've got some really cool protocols. I mentioned the FIDO Alliance. There's a number of standards that we don't need to go into, but they are all about verifying claims. Um, you know, identity management for me is about proving things about myself. I want to log on to a bank and prove that I have a particular bank account. Um, sometimes I want to log on and prove that I am the controller of a multi-party bank account with my wife. Um, sometimes I want to log on to a health service and prove my health identity. So it's all about proving things about me in different contexts. And hey, that's actually... A very similar problem to what we have with um, fake news and mm. provenance in the real world and in the IoT. So if identity isn't doing what we thought it was going to be, the good news is, rather, if, if identity isn't doing what we thought it was going to do, the good news is that the protocols and the devices and the, and the chips um, can be repurposed to do something that's much bigger and grander and actually more important. So I'm really optimistic that we're going to see some, some order um, in the supply chains of data. Um, in some sense, blockchain is a bit of a go at that. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the good things about blockchain have been a really well-intended effort to produce some order in the, you know, the chaos of supply chains. Um, we're going to get into that yeah. uh, whole blockchain thing in, in just a little bit. Um, before we do that, I wanted to ask you a little bit about attributes because attributes are a big part of this identity discussion but a lot of folks i'm not sure are clear on what that means you quoted uh google paypal or say uh veteran andrew nash is saying that attributes are more interesting than identity that was back in 2013 what what did he mean by that well personal attributes are the things that are interesting about us so maybe it's my date of birth or maybe it's just my age you know, mm. If I want to buy liquor online, I need to prove that I'm over 21. In this country, back home, I need to prove I'm over 18. So the things that matter vary from place to place and from one context to another. If I'm voting anonymously, I, I want to prove that I'm an eligible registered voter, and that's it. Um, so when, you know, we talk about that as being a form of digital identity. Um, mm. More correctly, it's an attribute that happens to be carried and controlled by Steve Wilson, and I want to be able to show that attribute and people need to know that it's reliable. Right. There's, there's dozens and dozens of them. Your bank account number is an attribute, your, your health identifier. Right. And one of the concerns about identity verification is making sure that those attributes, like there was a time I think he wrote where we were excited about some of that and then we realized someone could pull, bad actors could pull that together from our social media profiles oh, yeah. in some cases and, and we easily circumvent. So, so this is not to be confused with what's called knowledge-based authentication. That's the idea that instead of having an identifier, um, I prove a bunch of stuff or I, I tell a bunch of stories about myself and the person on the other end of the, of the cable um, presumes that it's Steve Wilson. No, this is, this is about knowing that there are certain things about me that you don't know, need to know anything else other than my age at a particular point in time. So that's what we mean by attributes. And look, I think, you know, Andrew Nash is um, now at Capital One doing really good work. He, he's been in this industry a long time. And um, not to put words in his mouth, but I took away from his statement in 2013 that the, the things that are really interesting and therefore the things that we should be managing and plumbing in exchanging reliably, you know, between people and devices is, is not their, their 
biological identity, but it's their, their specific attributes. One of the uh, interesting things that came up this morning in the in the fireside QA with uh, internet pioneer Vinton Surf was um, Ray Wong of Constellation was talking with him about the challenges of widespread internet adoption and access. And one thing he said that really struck me was, you know, just because you have access to the internet doesn't mean you know how to use it or mm. use it effectively, and that critical thinking skills will be necessary. And he spoke, uh, Mr. Surf spoke about scientists really and how our theories require validation and I thought that was so interesting because at the same time he expressed concern around deep fakes and how sophisticated those are already and how much more deep fakes being like machine generated you know facial composites or whatever yeah. they are <clears throat> it's freaky. and and I think it's going to be really interesting to see how we do with literacy versus the sophistication of some of the fraudulent activities going on. Yeah, look, I'm afraid I'm at odds with Vint on that one. I don't mm. think that we've really got any hope of being able to apply critical thinking um, day to day um, in, in that way. And, yeah. and we don't actually expect people to apply critical thinking in the 20th century as they make decisions about what aeroplane to fly on or whether this car is safe to drive or whether there's some drug is safe for me to take because I've got hay fever. We don't use critical thinking at that level. And um, we have to protect people against complexity. And so, you know, we do have the right level of regulation. Maybe this is controversial. I think the pharma companies would like less, but from a consumer point of view, you know, we regulate drug manufacture mm. because chemistry is complicated. So I don't think that critical thinking is enough. Um, we're asking people to... Firstly, we're asking people to understand protocols that they can't possibly. And we're also pe asking people to, to, to um, be better at this than the crooks. Mm. So we have this arms race, uh, deep fakes, classic example. You know, a couple of months ago, a chief executive received a phone call from somebody who told him to transfer money to another account. The voice that was telling him to transfer money was a deep fake. Mm. It was a synthetic voice that had been created to, to um, mimic the chief financial officer of the company and about $250,000 moved at the stroke of a keyboard because the chief exec couldn't tell. So, I mean, how do you protect against that? No amount of critical thinking is going to get people to be smarter than the crooks. The smartest people in the world are out there trying to work out how to use um, the internet for bad. Yeah, I think maybe to some extent it's a false debate because I, I would think, well, I don't know how Sir feels about regulation, but I think you could make the argument that both are important. That sure. That and so that there's, I think there's not necessarily a clash between those. Where where I do think it becomes more of an issue is how do you get there, and you know how do you get to the? If we agree that both these things are good, more savvy citizens, more you know, perhaps militant about their privacy, and then also better regulations. How do we get there? Like, and from a regulatory standpoint, I think one of the big concerns is not just anti-regulatory sentiment; it's the competency of the regulators. I mean, we, we had an anecdote recently, and I do not want to get into a political thing, but um, because I'm, I, I, I think the de a Democratic administration would have these same problems, but Rudy Giuliani, who's a, supposedly the cybersecurity chief, got locked out of his iPhone and had to go in to yeah. get help at an Apple store. You know, and, and these kinds of things happen all the time. Now, he's not a legislator, but the point is that a lot of folks who would struggle with very similar issues are the ones that we're looking to to establish these regulations. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, that we, I mean, frankly, a lot of these politicians should be here this, this week and, you know, listening in the audience with everyone else because they could really use the information. Look, where it, can, it comes back to why we call this safety, my, my theme of research at Constellation. If you think about car safety, if you think about electrical safety, People used to do their own electrical work, you know, at home in the 1800s, this new electricity that, you know, Edison and Tesla and others were creating whole new business models to, to, to send electricity around. And there were arguments about alternating current versus direct current. Extraordinary stuff. Um, and people did their own electrical work until their houses started burning down. And what we've got on, on the internet now, people's digital houses are burning down because they're doing their own security or they're being asked to apply, you know, in quotes, critical thinking to things that they can't possibly understand. So, you know, I call it civilization, And I don't want to argue about regulatory models either because, you know, it, it does require a good regulator, obviously. Right. But I think the word that I think about is civilization. You know, civilized people, um, they in fact collectively, as, a, as an agreement, they in fact um, have a compact with, with the state where 
they're looked after in, in matters right. of, of safety. Yep. And I think you can make the argument that GDPR was a reasonably competent Absolutely. piece of piece of legislation. It was so. look, it's terribly flawed. Um, nobody thinks it's perfect, but it's 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 a model. I think it's I've called it the light on the hill for the right level of regulation going well, forward. One thing I thought was revealing about GDPR was, you know, as someone who in our industry we're very conscious of email based communication because we get a lot of it. Oh. How all the all the weird email marketers and stuff all that that all kind of ran for the hills or their businesses went under or they had to close down when GDPR came out, it gave you some idea that this thing actually has some teeth There's and some these teeth, are the, yeah. the first people to go down were these hucksters, you know, so kind of shows you something there. And at the other end of town, it's been a bit of a surprise that um, some big mainstream companies, you know, um, Marriott and uh, British Airways and uh, Uber have been levied. Well, Uber was fined under the FTC, but Marriott and and British Airways received multi-hundred million dollar fines um, yep. under GDPR for, well, for, for not doing the right thing by the customers. So yep. in terms of protecting the public, and again, it comes back to that compact between the state and the, and the, and the, and the community, um, we, we have this agreement now that tends to be looking after people. All right. Well, I'm going to put in a stop here and we are going to dive into blockchain, which I think I may release as a separate discussion so we'll take a real short break